Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and researcher of Japanese war heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Daria Milnikova, Robert and Lisa Sainsbury Fellow at the Sainsbury Institute to discuss the arts movements of futurism in the early 20th century and how collaborating Russian and Japanese artists within the movement challenged its founding principles and Eurocentric nature. Good morning, Daria. We Thank hope you're joining me on the podcast today. Hello, Oli. So first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Okay, so my original training is in Japanese modern literature that I received in St. Petersburg State University, my home city. And uh, from Japanese literature, I uh, became more interested in uh, theater and performance, and but more contemporary performance, I would say. And gradually, I uh, came to the very beginning of the 20th century. So basically, my research covers a broad topic of performance art in the context of Japan, but also Japan in conversation with other countries such as Russia. I make uh, connections between Russian artists and dancers and theater directors and Japanese artists and Japanese theater directors as well, and move forward into the 1960s and sort of more recent uh, performance art practices. So uh, that's what I do. That's great. Now, uh, your article out this year, What is Futurism? Russia and Japan Exchange Answers, seeks to challenge the notion of Europe being the heart of modernism. For those of us unfamiliar with art history, could you explain for us what the modernism and futurism movements were? Also, could you give us a sense of what time period you're referring to here? Okay, that's a very broad, fundamental question. (laughs) I would say I'll try to be brief for the uh, sake of time. In general, when we're talking about modernism, we're thinking about the ways artists were innovating their language, innovating form, the medium itself. It's also a rejection of realistic representation um, by the artist in Europe. Just to give you an idea, we're talking about post-impressionism, fauvism, futurism, data, expressionism. So really all these isms uh, that are associated with modernism. And in terms of the time period, I would say it's roughly uh, second half of the 19th century to the early 60s, 1960s. But it also very, if we're taking a very broad definition of modernism. In terms of futurism, which belongs to one of the modernist movements, as you might know, or as the listeners might know, originated in Italy and is associated with the publication of a Futurist Manifesto in, uh, well, first it was uh, published in an Italian newspaper, then it was sort of reprinted in the uh, French uh, Le Figaro in 1909. And uh, the idea of the manifesto itself or the document, um, manifesto as a document, I would say is a very representational of the uh, movement of futurism. So artists would put a specific agenda, a specific, well, the manifesto itself is a sort of a political a political document, I would say. And Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, the, the Italian theorist and uh, the advocate for futurism as a, a rejection of the past and all sort of all the aesthetics uh, that were valued, the aesthetic of beauty that uh, were valued in the past. So this is his call for the rejection and calling for art to pursue other ways of representation and other subject matters, particularly uh, Italian futurists were fascinated by modern life itself and the city as the center of modern life. They were attracted to uh, the notion of electricity. They were really captivated by this urban lifestyle, by dynamic life, 
by the aesthetic of a machine and speed. So it's all about movement, I would say. And uh, when we're talking about Japan. Now, despite working at the Sainsbury Institute, I'm afraid I, I don't know much about fine arts, so you have to go easy on me here. Uh, could you explain some of the features typical of a futurist painting to help us make a mental image? Mm -hmm. Some of the examples, again, if we're talking about Italian futurism, that would be Umberto Boccioni, uh, his painting The City of Isis, or also uh, Dynamis of a Cyclist. Boccioni also created a, a very representational sculpture, unique forms of uh, continuity in space. So all those work address representation of movement through the means of a painting. So the principle of uh, chronophotography, sort of replicating the movement. So the idea of chronophotography is just to create a set of photographs of a moving object that is sort of showing the successive phases of motion. That's sort of the definition of uh, chronophotography and futurists, particularly uh, Giacomo Bala, uh, used and applied uh, this principle of chronophotography when, for example, his uh, painting Dynamis on a dog on a leash, it shows uh, instead of, let's say, uh, a dog with four legs with I don't know how many legs and it's sort of blurred and it's sort of given an impression that the dog is walking. So mm -hmm. it's really, I mean, when you're, you really need to see it, look it up because it sounds weird. <laughs> but, <laughs> a dog with, I don't know, uh, how many legs or a person with, uh, uh, for example, the face of uh, a man would be replicated and put on the same plane of uh, a moving object. So it's it's really deconstructing the form. It's uh, as if you're looking through a kaleidoscopic glass mm -hmm. and when you're moving uh, this glass, uh, sort of the, the image itself changes. When it comes to Russian futurism and then also to... Uh, Japanese futurism. I'll talk more about it, but the difference and the understanding uh, of the movement, and specifically for Russian artists to distance themselves from uh, the Western artists to uh, find their niche. And that's why it becomes more interesting, especially for me to, to investigate this movement. I see. That sounds fascinating. And we'll definitely have some examples linked into the description for people to have a look while they're listening to the episode. So how did the Japanese and Russian movements challenge the European or Western notion of futurism? So before, uh, I should say that in Russia, uh, futurism appeared as a literary movement but without the violent connotations of uh, its Italian counterpart. And the publication of a pamphlet or so-called almanac of Russian futurism, it's called Sadok Sudi, or A Trap for Judges, uh, that was published in 1910. And David Burluk was one of the key members of, of this literary futurist movement. So in this almanac, Poets were calling for an aesthetic revolution in literature, and they called for abandoning the legacy of Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and so forth. So their anarchy, if we can put it that way, was driven towards collapsing the aesthetic per se, I would say. And the idea of future and what the future of art looks like, or what the art of future is, definitely was the cornerstone of disagreement between the Italian futurism and uh, Russian futurists. For example, Marinetti, he visited Russia and met Russian futurism in February 1914, and he Criti I don't so criticized, but he definitely said that Russian artists are not following the uh, theories of the Italians. And instead of celebrating progress in all forms, Russian artists were 
looking at the some of the records, some of the Russian pictures were looking at the agrarian life of rural Russia, and they were trying to again distance themselves from the Western movements by uh, introducing more originally authentically Russian elements into the uh, art as a way to oppose the Italian movement. So we have, by uh, looking backward, temporal relative Russian portraits, uh, which is resonating with the uh, looking into the future vision of Marinetti and other Italian futurists. So that's the main, I would say, uh, difference uh, here. So does that mean that when with Russian futurism, they were looking more at agrarian concepts rather than uh, the urban trends that was being seen in Europe? Uh, exactly. Uh, so I can, uh, I think uh, it's just um, goes to your question about uh, the uh, national identity, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, and again, uh, when David Burluk is uh, uh, publishing a response to a very prominent and influential art critic, Alexander Benoit. So he is explaining the position of Russian artists, of Russian futurists, because they want to assert their particularity. They want to put themselves in a position uh, of, uh, to the West. And Burlu calls the rotten West. <laughs> And so they're interested in national art. And by national art, they talking about such elements as icon, lubok prints, signboards, embroidery. So very quintessentially Russian culture. But at the same time, it's like saying it's life itself. And especially when we're talking about such you know, as a signboard. So these are something from the everyday life. And the everyday life, which is not some kind of high, but it's really coming from the lower culture rather than, it's not primitive, but it's in a sense, they, they are self-primitivizing their art. So I just uh, briefly explain all modernist movements in Europe, but when it comes to Japan, most of these futurist movements are arriving with a very small gap between them. So while there is some time between, let's say, post-impressionism and futurism, when it comes to Japan, they're uh, practically arriving at the same time. And often not all the signs of a particular movement is grasped or understood or embraced, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, Japanese futurists. That's why in the examples, because right after the publication of Marinetti's manifesto in Le Figaro, Mori Ogai is translating this manifesto and it's, it's published in a Subaru journal. So there is definitely a curiosity and interest young Japanese artists towards this movement. And stylistically, I would say that it's more a fusion of French cubism even analytical cubism with the ideas of the Italian futurism. And again, if we are talking about specific examples of Japanese futurists, I would call for Seiji Togo and his painting of plain controversy. But again, it's not so much about the representation of movement. He actually was more interested by the representation of music rather than movement. And this is, as he was artistically emerged, he was working in a studio that was next to musicians. And in this plain contrast, he's actually depicting his fellow friend, a musician. So he explained this painting that he wanted to create, and I'm quoting, I wanted to create a musical picture expressing the rhythm of music with colors and lines and that's basically what he's doing, though we are labeling this work as futurist, but it's more a melange of cubism and futurism. And the emerging interests of Japanese artists towards the representation of music, dance, movement, that's something that definitely, I would say, differentiates them from other artists. 
that uh, we spoke uh, so far. And uh, another futurist, Fumon Gyo, for example, in 1918, he's also exhibiting a painting, humoresque dance of Mr. Ishii, which depicts at the time uh, a young Japanese dancer, Baku Ishii, who would become the founder, I would say, of modern dance. So really, there is a growing interest towards the representation of dance among Japanese futurists that already we see even before Kinoshita and Borluk are working within the frame of the Futurist Art Association. The only thing that I would like to add maybe about Japanese modernism itself is that there is a specific painting that is associated with the, this moment when uh, if we talk about modernism as a critique of art as an institution, when that would be the, the painting of uh, Yorozo Tetsuburo, uh, reclining nude when the artist is creating an attack on the uh, authority of the academy, which became quite influential in creating or in promoting the image of Japanese nation through art. I see. So the 1910s and 1920s were an extremely turbulent time for both Japan and Russia. You have the uh, Russian Revolution and subsequent Bolshevik Revolution, the Russo-Japanese War, and the social upheaval in Japan that marks the Taisho era in, in, in the 20s. How did the Futurism movement capture this moment and bring together artists from both countries? Okay. So when uh, David Burluk uh, comes to Japan, uh, he is escaping the revolution and he is escaping the civil war after the revolution. And it's definitely a difficult time for new art or uh, for avant-garde art in, uh, in particular. And when he arrives to Japan, he, is, he found himself as an immigrant. Uh, a form from a former Russian empire. At the same time, when he's meeting Kinoshita Shuichiro, who is one of the founder of the FAA, Futurist Art Association, who is the founder of the Futurist Art Association. And in this moment, when Japan is already becoming disillusioned with the ideas of modernization and uh, westernization um, and uh, Japanese artists are looking at their own uh, national origins to pose to the rest. So uh, not necess- both uh, Japanese and Russian futurists were not necessarily seeking to pursue any social agenda through their art. They were more motivated by the, by more, I would say, individual expression. And that's why they were often criticized by specifically Japanese art critics who were not seeing this social agenda in their art. So I'm sort of curious. It seems to me that the Japanese and Russian artists you referred to in the futurism movement were actively working against the wishes of their governments in some cases, yet you suggest that these artists, some of whom were working in exile, formed a nationalistic aesthetic. So how do you make sense of this complicated idea of national identity amongst the futurist artists? Again, I would speak more, I think, here about Japanese futurists and specifically what Kinoshita uh, Shuichiro was doing. He chose a very specific subject for his paintings, Maiko, which is a geiko apprentice, so a, a young girl who is uh, trained to become an uh, entertainer who is uh, uh, learning uh, dance and singing and playing instruments. So this is a new national subject uh, that Japanese artists, for example, Kurosa Seiki and Suchita Bakusen were as emblematic of modern Japanese art. So this was very representation of the time period. And what Kinoshita is doing, instead of showing a modern girl, right, who is 
an emblem of modernity. This with short haircuts, right? She's self-aware and uh, she's independent. So instead of pursuing this subject that is associated with modernity, Kinoshita is taking Michael and he's showing her dance and he's showing the dynamism of her dance. I would say the subject matter is more about the dynamism of the dancing girl, the dynamism of Michael rather than Michael itself. So in a sense, he's trying to reconcile the Western and Japanese in one painting. So the language, the artistic language that he's using, so he's uh, taking from uh, some principles from Burluk in, in showing the movement of, uh, of Michael in the watercolor that I got from Fukui uh, Museum. Uh, this uh, watercolor shows Michael in emphasis and profile at the same time. And also he's showing, he's shifting the lines. So he's uh, showing a little bit the movement of her head. In another example, Michael, which is only black and white that I have, a postcard that shows Michael. She's, he's also uh, showing a little bit her fan in motion and her head in motion. So he can, uh, can I deconstructed the composition by shifting the spatial planes and he captured both the profile and the multiplied on first view of the dancer on the same plane, emphasizing an effect of simultaneity. That's a better way to describe it. And I would like to also read a small part of the so-called statement, Awaken Friends to Fellows of the Futurist Art Association, that was published in uh, Midway Journal in 1922 in which Kinoshita clearly is emphasizing a dancing girl as an embodiment of futurism for, for Japanese artists. So he is writing, dancing girls, you who crazily leap in a ballroom, you are an embodiment of genuine beauty and geometric rhythm, symmetry, spirality, vortex, spiral, whirlpool, straight, right, acute, obtuse, singular, semicircular, spherical. So, you see that he's using a lot of vocabulary from geometry, but mm -hmm. that very well describes the goal that Kinoshita is pursuing in uh, trying to capture the dynamic of a dancing body, the dynamic of Maiko. He's saying dancing girl, which is not exactly Maiko, it's Odoriko, but nevertheless, when we see examples of Kinoshita's paintings, it's Maiko. So though he's uh, referencing to dancing girl in general, he's specifically choosing Michael uh, as his subject. Thank you for answering my questions, Daria. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us any other projects you're currently working on? So currently I am working on a, ma a book manuscript, Body Camera Action, Japan in conversation with the global avant-garde. And this project covers almost 100 year history of performance art in Japan. I start my conversation from early futurist experimentation with the representation of movement and the subject of dance. And then talking about Bakushi and Murayama Tomoyoshi as not just practitioners of modern dance, but also theoreticians who write their own theories and create their specific training techniques. So that's currently what I've been uh, working on. Well, thank you, Daria, for joining us on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Ali. It was nice talking to you, and thank you. You can find a link to Daria's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Kanako Nakamura, General Manager of Digital Interactive Rehabilitation System, DigiDeha for short, to discuss tech, art, and rehabilitation. Kanako will explain how technological innovations and digital arts can revolutionize monotonous rehabilitation processes for disabled children, creating a joyful, customized experience and fostering interactive relationships with family members. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.